Uh, wanted to follow up on the conversation that the gentlelady from Allegheny County had with you earlier today with regard to substitute teachers. And last December, the governor signed House Bill 412 into law. I believe it was Act 91. And the bill was sponsored by the gentlelady from Cumberland County. Um, I had the Senate companion legislation actually put forward a pretty comprehensive amendment to that bill. And the legislation was titled Substitute Teacher Shortage. It received strong bipartisan support uh, here in the Senate and also in the House. And the act contains a, a number of, I think, very useful actions to help relieve our ongoing shortage of substitute teachers. And I realize it's going to take some time for the provisions to be executed. Um, and we must continue to, to devise interim solutions uh, to meet what I think is really a most urgent need. Um, I was surprised to read in my local newspaper, it was January 20th, an article by, uh, well, the article quoted Casey Smith, who is the spokesperson for your department, and he was quoted as saying that the department does not track substitute teacher shortages, but has heard anecdotally from schools that it is difficult for them to find substitutes. So, and I can tell you, look, it's a really serious problem in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, I, I had one of my staff members, in, in anticipation of sitting down and talking to you today, reach out to a friend who was a substitute teacher. He said, can you ac access that substitute teacher website and just give me an idea? What is it like in your county and in one school district? Uh, that day, when she tried it, it was about a week ago to this day, there were 12 openings for substitutes on Friday at one of our high schools and 16 openings for substitutes on Friday in York City schools. Parents in York County, they continue to share with me that public elementary school principals are routinely, um, they disperse students into other classrooms, they double up classes, principals themselves are stepping in. Many of our principals were educators as well, so they're probably very qualified to do that. But Reading and other specialists are being assigned from their primary duties. Kindergarten classes are frequently seeing vacancies that need to be filled. So I, I think that picture is probably similar across the Commonwealth. So I have to believe uh, that you feel this shortage is a significant problem across the state. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So as the head of the department, you've had a hand in determining educational policies, allocation of resources. How are you and the school districts assessing the magnitude of the problem? Sure. And so, you know, in terms of what we collect for data, and I'll ask Dr. Garcia to provide some insight on that, uh, because we do capture the usage of certain permits, emergency certifications, and things like that as well from our schools. So I don't know what you could disaggregate from that to provide sort of a portrait. Uh, as we've been working at the moment with regards to the crisis around substitute or emergency uh, uh, teachers, much of this has been as a response to the requests that have been coming to us from the educators, right? This is what we need right now, this very minute. It was our intent to try to be methodical about a solution, Senator, uh, around this particular issue because as you can imagine, I think what was promulgated forward in terms of some flexibility had to do with reducing the prerequisites <laughs> to becoming a substitute teacher uh, from, I think, a bachelor's degree to 60 hours is what we ended up. Those kinds of changes um, have significant impact and yielded a lot of feedback from us, but we had to move on something very quickly. And so we wanted to put something in place that did not take away from an understanding of what was needed to be in the classroom and accounted for situations where you may need to have someone who is not just a, and I hate to use this, but who's not just a body in the room because they're right. working with young learners mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody at the secondary level. Mm -hmm. And so this was a way to sort of get there as well. And I think what we need to pivot to now is to figure out what was the efficacy of what we did? How do we know it worked? Yeah, and, and I think data could go a long way. You know, are we keeping track of the vacancies? Are we keeping track of failures to fill? So when they put the all call out for a substitute, I mean, things have evolved greatly from, you know, back in the day when I was a kid where it was probably a phone call tree, right? Yeah, um, that's what it was. Teachers would call through and see until they could find a substitute. And, you know, what are the, what's the cause of the vacancies? And 
somehow quantifying the, the number of registered substitutes, the fill rate of those positions, fill rates by substitute and so forth, I, you know, looking at that data I think would be helpful. And I think outside of what's outlined in Act 91, you know, it would be good to know what actions the department is taking or undertaking mm -hmm. to help support schools in addressing um, this crisis, not just this year, but also going forward in the future. That would be very helpful. Sure, certainly. Um, what can uh, our superintendents expect in terms of further guidance from your department regarding the use of student teachers as substitutes? Sure. Uh, do you want to provide some insight? Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that question, um, Senator. So um, actually just had that conversation with someone um, in Deputy Secretary Garcia's um, office that we need to put some information out on the student teachers and the use of them as substitutes. We did um, gave them a, a two-pager on the classroom monitor so they had um, exact because we can't just assume they know how to use these uh, positions. So we need to be more explicit in our instruction for that. So they can anticipate they'll be getting something in the next week too or how they can use their student teachers for the substitute position. I think they're looking forward to that and would appreciate it. Um, has there been any discussion to amend Chapter 354 of the PA Code regarding teacher preparation programs to give universities and colleges greater flexibility to allow student teachers to teach independently during that student teaching process? Yeah, and so you want to put forward some sure. thoughts around 354, and I just want to point out that we just are getting close to wrapping up chapter 49 and I think yes. moving to 354 is the obvious next step. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. So the Chapter 354 regulations are around educator preparation programs, as you correctly stated, but for the benefit of everyone here. Uh, the last time these regulations were updated was, I believe, in 2008. And so many, many changes are long overdue in updating uh, the ed prep programs and how uh, they prepare the future generations of teachers as well as, you know, take part in, um, you know, uh, improving the student teaching experience and the like. So the Chapter 49 regulations that, uh, that are carrying where I was at this morning um, they were just approved by the commission, uh, by the Independent Regulatory Review Commission, and so uh, that really uh, starts the clock for us to now be able to uh, uh, engage at prep programs, 119 of them across the Commonwealth, on how to uh, revitalize and increase alignment between the ed prep programs, their graduates, and uh, meet the needs of local uh, school districts. So uh, chapter 354 is, um, uh, the update is long overdue, and what we're uh, going to be working on uh, in, in, in partnership with the 119 programs across the Commonwealth is really uh, updating and uh, making much stronger the connections between uh, the school districts and the uh, colleges and universities with these colleges of education. So that being said, 354 is a, um, those regulations uh, are, uh, uh, PDE is the required body for updating those regulations, and we will be beginning um, uh, the, the, the groundwork and, and the setting up of conversations to look at existing requirements, uh, looking at uh, whether the GPA requirement and other such um, barriers, essentially, really prevent us from uh, creating a robust educator workforce uh, for the 21st century. Yeah, and, and I think that is important. And, and I, I would imagine it would be similar to that teacher intern program, uh, mm -hmm. that we may be able to bring some of those programs together um, in terms of allowing that individual to teach independently and uh, addressing the compensation as well. Absolutely. Um, we, we began to touch on this, um, and, and we know that there's also a significant challenge in uh, bringing educators into the workforce. Do you have any plans to develop some reciprocity with other states regarding their teaching certificates, right? So uh, we know that Pennsylvania has always had um, fairly uh, robust 
um, challenging requirements to become a certified teacher. Other states now have surpassed us. Um, when we start talking about teacher shortages, and, and you know, I pulled this binder off of my, my desk, and back in 2017, I was having these conversations with you, um, Senator Gebhard, the uh, senator from Lebanon County, broached this topic with you, but the constriction of the certification bans and the impact that it's had, particularly on the upper elementary uh, certifications, and, and of course we struggle with science and math and, mm -hmm. and special education. So any plans or conversations going on with states that have commensurate certification or requirements or who exceed our certification requirements? So at the moment, we do um, honor uh, certifications from out-of-state certified uh, uh, educators to come into Pennsylvania. Uh, we are part of a national, um, I can't remember the, the, the name of the exact, uh, it's, it's not necessarily reciprocity. Yeah, and I, and yeah. I understand that, except what I'm being told is that even uh, educators who are certified in other states that exceed our standards still have to go through significant hoops and hurdles and, and classwork and, um, you know, we experienced this with the legislation that I wrote um, several years ago with regard to our military spouses um, mm -hmm. who were teaching in Dodd schools and had been certified other places. Um, and we made them go through all kinds of hurdles. Uh, very qualified educators that we could use in our classrooms, we erect barriers. So um, if there are ways that we can reduce barriers, I, I think that that would be helpful, especially in York County where we're, we're a border community. Um, e even on the east and the west of, of, our, of our state, I think it would probably be helpful to those districts. Are, are there any plans for the state to publicize alternative teaching pathways, such as the teacher intern program? Um, I, I think, you know, as we struggle to fill those positions, it could be a critical tool for finding and recruiting new teachers who maybe did not take that traditional pathway into the classroom. Yes, we're exploring several innovations in that space, and uh, in the next uh, month or so, uh, we will be uh, uh, sharing our educator workforce strategy for Pennsylvania that includes many innovations that other states have implemented to address many of the issues that you've raised. Part of uh, the other, uh, to your point about STEM educators and this educator workforce in that area, we're also going to be uh, releasing uh, uh, a grant application for aspiring to educate uh, pilots that are gonna be focused on STEM uh, teachers. And so that is another uh, effort that is underway in order to address the critical staffing teacher shortages in those uh, important uh, areas. Good. Um, Senator Phillips Hill, I think you raise a really important issue, and I think one of the things that uh, we've come out to say a few times, and I want to say again because I think this is important for folks to understand, when we move forward to thinking about changes we had to make around educator preparation, the one thing that we did is we did not allow for some distinctions to be made between your traditional ed prep program and alternative providers. In fact, what we uh, made a decision to do was to hold them both in the same regard because we need both of them in order to fill the shortages that we have in Pennsylvania. And before, there was a distinction that was made, and it wasn't a popular move to elevate alternative providers, but we have to in places where they could be much more efficient and much more affordable. And in some way, we looked at it as a way for it to raise the uh, uh, productivity of all our ed prep providers to meet that need, right? There's places that have been using alternative providers for some time. So I just wanted to put that out there that I think we need to continue to explore what traditionally was considered the non-traditional routes and elevate them into making them traditional pathways as well. Otherwise, we're, we're not gonna make the dent that we need to make. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.